Radio. Tune in to the Chris and Wayne Show every Thursday night at 8 o'clock on Terramaniaradio.com. Up aboard the haunted ship of doom and join Captain Chris. It was the government secretly outside of the studio. Skipper Wayne. I think it's time you get the cracking out of your butt. Deck wench Joe. Yeah, I got stuck on the corner. And of course, cabin boy Todd. Oh, look where I'm sitting. And always remember our motto, don't just listen to the mayhem, be a part of it. Views expressed and the opinions given by the individual hosts and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Paramania, its affiliates, or its sponsors. You are listening to Paramania Radio. Search UK Radio Show with your hosts Kerry Greenaway and Jay Lynch right here on Paramania Radio. Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to the Parasearch UK Radio Show. I am I am nobody, but I have a wonderful, beautiful co-host named Kerry Greenaway who's on the other side of the pond. Hi, love. How are you? I'm a lot better, thank you, Jay. <laughs> you sound a lot better. I've missed oh, you last week. I had no voice, so I do apologise for letting everybody down last week. But oh, I'm back, and my voice no. is back. Yay! Hon, you didn't let anybody down. We were just more worried about your health and stuff. And we had actually Teresa and Andy just took the show over. Me and uh, Doctor Dave just sat back and I don't know, chilled. I, honestly, they did an amazing job. So thank you guys for that because that was brilliant. I thoroughly enjoyed listening to that one. Yeah, it was good. Good. I was proud of them. Yeah, they did a really good job. I was like, I need to retire. <laughs> Dr. Dave and myself did retire for the night, didn't we? So. <laughs> You've uh, actually got scheduled with one hell of a guest. I know the young man. Uh, met him a few times and stuff and talked with him before. Mr. John McCoy, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing all right. How's it? How's everybody else? Mean. Oh, you're always mean. mean. No, I'm not, not mean. I'm the nice one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Doing good. How have you been, Bub? What have you been up to? I have been steadily working, working, and working. Well, it looks like to me you got some other things going on, which we'll get into. But uh, uh, you've been not just working all the time. Now, you've, you've gotten into law enforcement since the last time I talked to you. Yes. Uh, I'm actually a deputy sheriff down here in the great state of Louisiana. It's uh, Quite a, ta- a, a challenge, a challenging job, and uh, some sometimes I think that serving in the military was a lot easier than this, because uh, you know serving in Iraq, downrange in the military, you know it's a very different mindset. And if you if you you go to war, you like okay, this is this is is what what I what I got to do. You come to terms with it. You take care of business. When you're working in law enforcement. It's a chess match. It's not like open conflict. So you've got to be very careful about what you say, about what you do, about how you 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 carry yourself. One wrong move, and you're going to be on the nightly news. And it can be about literally anything. And it doesn't even matter if you do good or if you do do something, something bad, because once someone sees that badge, once someone sees that 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 uniform you have on. You're automatically a bad a bad person in their eyes, and we get a and we have a group called Antifa who's uh, apparently saying uh, what no, uh, November fourth they're going to start open warfare on all law law enforcement. So <laughs> joy, but I've seen uh, clips online of police officers playing basketball with with some kids on the street and people just went, went went nuts over it so if you do good no one remembers no one cares if you do bad no one will ever forget well that's with anything i mean even with what the field that we're in because i mean i met you through the paranormal so yeah uh and and same thing there if you do something right you do it good nobody hard talks about it, but boy you make the slice little mistake or say something somebody don't like and you're crucified oh yeah here's three here's three nails 
Not that I've ever had that happen to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you laugh. You laugh hard. <laughs> I get I, I get in trouble for everything, so I just go ahead and do what I want to because I know no matter – like I said, no, I could – I could build a thousand bridges to cross all these things of water, but I burn one of them, and I'm a son of a bitch. So <laughs> I don't uh, care. I don't care. I want to do what I want to do. There's, there's always someone ready to call you out, though. To be fair. Yeah, I don't know why. It's like I get that target on my back. It's like call Jay out. I'm like Jay will just call you back. <laughs> <laughs> I'll trump that call. So that- there's actually a lot of confusion that that goes around about what a deputy does compared to what a police officer does. A deputy, uh, they they help control the courts, they help control the jail, they deliver subpoenas and warrants, they they serve eviction notices, and and most sheriff's office do have a traffic division. So we do everything a regular police officer does, but for the entire county or down here in Louisiana, we call a parish. So it's like we got like five times more responsibility, and the 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 county or parish sheriff is actually the chief executive law enforcement officer of the county. So they they tell even the police departments what what to do. A deputy has way more authority than any police officer. A police officer has their their little district. We observe the entire county. Wow. So how close are you to New Orleans for when I come through there at the end of the month? Uh, I I live in in Harvey, which uh, it takes me maybe ten minutes to drive to. Well, say if I'm coming through your county or your parish while I'm coming down that way, I'm gonna be name dropping the hell out of you. Know that right? I get in trouble. I'm like, hey, I, I know Deputy John John McCoy. <laughs> <laughs> when he's in trouble, he's gonna be calling your name out. You know this, hell John? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that guy. I'm going this way. <laughs> Just, the reason I want to do is because I want to make sure that you don't let him throw the key away. Keep the key, damn it! I might need to get out someday. <laughs> we don't. We don't have locked doors at the jail. They're they're sliding doors, so you're going nowhere. Come on, man! I got to eventually get out. I've never done nothing that bad. That I welcome, know of. To, welcome to Orleans Parish. Oh, once you go in, you never come out. <laughs> There's a joke in there. there but I swear to God, I gotta be nice. <clears throat> anyway, John, how did you get into the paranormal? Well, I first got into the the paranormal when I was about six years old. Uh, my my grandfather had died <sighs> during during the the funeral. You know, everybody was saying, uh, "Hey, he died and and gone gone to heaven." Which I found strange because I saw the man standing in the corner of my room going, why the hell are you there when you're supposed to be over there? So that didn't quite make sense to me. So I was asking my mom, hey, um, why is my grandpa in the room? He's not. He's in, he is in heaven. So that kind of fascinated me. So I wanted to learn everything I could about it. So imagine being six years old reading about Edmund Wright Moore. Imagine being six years old and while everyone else is reading the pop-up books and Dr. Seuss, I am reading How to Be a Ghost Hunter. And then uh, by, by the time I was, was 10 years old, we were living in Carson City, and that's when I actually did – the first ever paranormal investigation that I ever did, and of course I knew I did it wrong at the time. Well, then I thought I was the, I was the, the neatest thing since, since sliced bread, but going back and looking on it, yeah, I was kind of stupid. But I, I I had a Polaroid camera, I had the old uh, analog voice recorder, and I was just walking through a cemetery because it made sense to me at the time. Hey, dead people, paranormal activity. Dead people, paranormal activity. But na- naturally, I did. I didn't catch anything. But that kind of just started a like, I guess, a downhill for me because I haven't stopped since. And the more I investigated, the more I learned. But I also learned that the more the more I went into it to learn more, the more questions I actually had coming out of it. And it wasn't until I was about like sixteen or seventeen that I actually saw my first paranormal reality show. And I'm like, hey, I'm not the only weirdo who does this. And uh, I think it was Rob Dimmerist on Ghost Hunters International that I first watched. I'm not entirely sure. 
But me and my mom, we would actually sit down and watch it religiously. Every time Ghost Hunters come on, every time Ghost Adventures came on, every time Ghost Hunters International come on. Uh, I remember watching Paranormal Files Factor Fate going, Mom, that's exactly what I want to do when I grow up. And here I am. Okay. <laughs> Quite a journey. Uh, Some would say. <laughs> So of all the things you've learned along the way, what's been the most, you know, profound, do you think? It, the most profound learning experience really wasn't learning about ghosts. It was learning about people. Because at the end of the day, people are what we are, about, are, what we are investigating in the paranormal. You, you can hear any ghost story, that ghost story come from a person. You can hear any story based off of religion. Well, religion is an aspect of human idea, ideology and culture. So when you get down to the root of everything that goes into the paranormal being there or the paranormal being anything that is alongside of adjacent to or different than normal, think pet, think parrot, paramilitary. The, the, uh, the police force is a paramilitary organization. Well, the paranormal is a paranormal sort sort of field. So when you're so when you're actually getting into studying what the paranormal is, ultimately you're studying a person. I agree with that. Oh wow, she's already agreeing with that already. Yeah, night. I agree it's with that. Good, no, I, I agree. It's, show. it's a study of people, whether or not they're alive or they're dead. And also I think, you know, you can't take out the people factor when you're investigating. The more I investigate, the more I look at the people I'm with rather than what I'm there for. Exactly. And we also have to have to understand, too, you know, how we are in 2017 is not how we were in 1920 or 1830 or 1776. I think taking an American now compared to what an American was in 1776 is going to be polar opposite. If you take an English person from how they are now back to 1776, they would be polar opposite as well. And and not just that. It, you can even look at the cultures in northern England compared to the cultures in southern England. And from what I understand, people in Derby don't really get along with people in London. It's the same here in in America. Oh what? no, man! Them Southerners love them New Yorkers. <clears throat> well, well. Especially, especially them fools from Texas. They really love them New Yorkers. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you causing trouble, Jay? <laughs> we can't. We can't get along across the street in this country. We're the biggest, most dysfunctional, functional family ever, uh, on existence. We can't that, agree on anything. Period. That is exactly the point, too. It's twenty seventeen. Let's let's take a look at these Antifa dudes. Not trying to get all political, but there's a there's a very big point to this. Back in 1972, there was a book that came out called the Anarchist Cookbook. This book gave detailed instructions on how to make weapons, explosives, how to kill somebody. Well, in re- very soon after that book was released, the dare I say, liberal side of the the political aspect started attacking, started hurting people, starting doing terroristic things. Let's take a look at 2017. I'd say the same thing is going on now. Let's rewind back to 1865 to the formation of of the KKK in, in, in Pulaski, Tennessee. We can say that that was a terroristic organization. Let's go back to 1776. No offense against English people, obviously, but in the mindset in 1776, the English were considered terrorists, enemies of the state. So how much of that ideology has actually changed since the birth of the of the United States until now? So if we have this much tension going on nowadays, imagine the tension that was going on 200, 300 years ago. So you're going to step into a location, you're going to not look of that culture, you're not going to talk like you're part of that culture, you're not going to smell like you're part of that culture, you're not going to appear in any shape, form, or fashion 
as being part of that culture. If we have so much bigotry in, in today's world and we can't get along, how are we going to get along with an entity, a spirit, an energy from 200 years ago? The thing is, the thing is, I have a little problem with this one, is that going back 200 years, you had didn't have the cross culture that you have today. And also, you didn't have the social interaction. So you didn't have the social migration that you have today. Right. You so I understand, your, I understand your point in regards to how can we relate to um, an alleged entity or spirit mm-hmm. from 200 years ago. But I wouldn't say it's um, as profound as the social or political divides that we have necessarily today. Well, I, it's it's not just a a political aspect. It's it's just a people aspect. So, psychology te- teaches us a lot about the human brain. And if you if if you're going to go back two hundred, three hundred, four hundred plus years, you know, I'll just use something that I that I wrote about in in Paranormal Exposed. We're going to go investigate Vlad Tepesh in Transylvania or Romania. Everybody on board that would that would be a great investigation i'll go I'll investigate awesome. anyway, I'll yeah go. yeah I'll, I'll go on that one yeah i'm with you let's bear we'd have to learn the language though absolutely now i would also say that we oh. might need some robes some some objects at the time that would be pleasing to a lot of passion especially if a lot of passion is going to be who we are trying to make make contact with let's bear in mind that this is the same man that also impaled thousands of his own country people to make a statement against the invading Turks. Let's also bear in mind that this man is the one who also had a nail driven into the turban of one of these people who refused to take the turban off of their head in the presence of Lot Depeche. I'd say he's got issues. So, <laughs> Do you reckon? <laughs> Sorry. We're, we're going to go into Sigisorda. We're going to go into Romania. He wasn't exactly welcoming of outside cultures then. I would say he's still not exactly privy to it now, even though it's been, what, almost a thousand years? Maybe maybe a little more since his reign of terror. Mm-hmm. So if if we're taking into consideration the culture, we we also have to make sure that we are trying to present ourselves as respectful as possible. Because one one of two things is is going to happen. One, we're going to piss them off, and the next thing you know, we're engaging in, in open warfare. Or he's not going to waste his time and talk talk to us at all. We don't know either way. And uh, there's actually been one paranormal reality show, dare I say the name, uh, that they actually got this part right. And I don't know if the evidence that, that they caught afterwards wa- was correct, but they actually brought alcohol. They brought offerings to the spirit to appease the spirit and that's something i think we need to be doing a lot more during investigations instead of walking in going hey can you give me a sign of your presence Mm -hmm. so if we're going to be going to speak to vlad depesh we need to be able to do the 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 investigation from as low tech of a perspective as possible well yeah Vlad, vlad depesh might be used to seeing tourists he might be used to seeing different people coming in and out of his castle but I wouldn't think that many people are actually trying to make contact with him, especially when they're sitting alone in the dark. So you got all these lights and gadgets and beeps and swirls and hot pockets and all this, you know, fancy equipment that you're bringing in to your your location. To me, it doesn't make sense to bring in all the all those gadgets and gizmos because if you're talking to someone who who was alive a thousand years ago. They saw nothing like that before in their life, and chances are it might actually intimidate them or scare them to make them not want to speak speak, speak to you. So you can go through all the preparation you want to, but if you if you scare someone, you might not get the the result that you're after. And I can also say the same thing about the wardrobe of, of, of investigators because I, I see these investigators all the time who, who dress out in 5'11", tactical gear, bulletproof vests. I'm talking like 
are they a SWAT team or are they? Uh, <laughs> yeah. For real, I have literally seen people get tacked out in all the fancy SWAT gear to go on an investigation. I'm like, why? And if you take a look at anyone in the world, if you show up looking like you're military or paramilitary, you're going to instill instill fear and people ain't going to want to interact with you. So where we're going with this basically is more like uh, we talk about an experiment in the UK called the Singapore theory, Mm -hmm. which is basically where you help to or try to recreate um, an atmosphere in regards to clothing and the location and the smells and sometimes doing the jobs that, you know, the person might have done, you know, before you go on an investigation rather than just turning up, as you say, in all SWAT gear. Um, (laughs) uh, We don't have bulletproof vests in the UK like that, though, so just say. Um, So that's really where you're going is like recreating um, you, you know, your team goes in more in the view of recreating the atmosphere of what ever entity that you're trying to contact to make it more comfortable for them to step forward. Absolutely. That's exactly where I'm going with it. I mean, there's you sure there's, there's really no specific way on how to do an investigation. We kind of all just fire from the hip, so to speak. But I think if you try and make it as comfortable for the spirit as possible, you're going to find that you will have a lot better interaction. And this is something that I've even learned a lot more of working in, in, in law enforcement and as well as in, in the military. You know, you've got to be able to relate to the people that you are interacting with. And it's, it's, it's the same in the, the paranormal. You, 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 not only, not, no, la, la, sorry. you not only have to be able to interact well with your client, you also have to, have to, have to understand what they, what they are needing. You also have to have to understand that when we're going to to investigate these beings that we're trying to make co- contact with are also people. So being able to relate to them and make it as comfortable for them as possible is very is basically the same way as as conducting an an interview for a radio show or a TV show or just a sit down and talk. You want to make it as comfortable and at as as much of a, a relaxed exchange as possible. Oh, I totally agree with you. I think you definitely get a better reaction when, you know, you are more relaxed and, you know, um, open to the possibilities of the spirits that are in the location, which you do before you go there. You generally hear the alleged hauntings that are there, but you don't always get what you thought or think you're going to get when you walk into a location. So you could try and, you know, act in a way that makes the spirit you think you could be contacting comfortable and actually get something completely different. So how would you, how would you evolve that in an investigation? Doing as much research as you possibly can. There is no real, you know, surefire way to understand who, who you are talking to. You can ask a slew of questions. You can try and do, do true rigor objects. But I, I, I have found that if if you use comedy, if you if you understand at least portions of the culture, you actually have a much better chance of being able to get a positive experience. And um, I I've actually put this to the test a lot. Uh, there's a uh, <clears throat> there's there's a museum in Biloxi, Mississippi. Um, it's the last known home of of the Confederate President Jefferson Davis. It's called. Mm-hmm. The, the Beauvoir. Now, I uh, obviously have no sympathetic ties to the the Confederacy. I don't like the flag. I don't like any of that crap. But I am a veteran, so I used my experience in the military to sort of honor the spirits that were there at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier in the cemetery at the Beauvoir. And there's a an inscription that was uh, that's that's written on on the front of the tomb by the Confederate poet. I can't you know, for the life of me think of his name. Uh, so I I I I read this inscription and then I would play taps on my phone, which is the fe- uh, the military fe- funeral march. 
I would I would I would, would introduce myself, uh, name and rank, and I would get I, I would pay honor to the fallen veterans. The first time I did this, uh, there was a girl that was investigating with us. And this was her first time ever investigating, had no idea anything outside of what she saw on TV. And she felt something hug her and then could like not pinch her her ear, but like grab, grab, grab onto it. And we did a spot read of her ear with the, the thermometer and her ear was actually 10 degrees hotter than her other ear. And it followed her around the entire cemetery. And we actually tried doing a, an isolation with her to see if whatever was there we just wanted to speak to her directly. Well, that session lasted all of but maybe 10 seconds before she ran out of there. So uh, we actually had to, had to get her, her to calm down and tell the spirit, hey, I understand you, you, you want to make, make contact with, you, with me, but you're making me uncomfortable. Please leave me alone back away from me and and when she said that the activity stopped the second time i i did the experiment i left out the inscription i had no activity the third time i went to it i did the inscription but i didn't didn't use taps and i had no experience so it was it, it's all of a playing as you go seeing mm-hmm. seeing seeing what works and what doesn't work Okay. No, no, that's fine. Um, that's not a particularly respectful response, though, is it? Not exactly, but and sometimes you do have to ask questions that aren't comfortable. You sometimes do have to understand that you're dealing with people of a mindset that don't exactly correlate with your own, and. I felt very, very wrong doing that that sort of thing because it, it's, it's polar opposite of my my personal views. But as a paranormal investigator, I have to look at the world from as much of a broader perspective instead of just seeing it from one secular view, viewpoint. Do you not feel that most investigation teams do what you're suggesting anyway? I mean, we do, we work quite extensively in the UK in that way, because obviously we have um, a more extended history mm. um, than you guys over in America. Um, so we do try as much as we can to incorporate different methods of working right. in the field. But because we expand over such a huge history, it's incredibly important um, or difficult, sorry, not important, but incredibly difficult sometimes to yeah. pin it down. I mean, um, you know, you could have several different spirits allegedly haunting a location from, you know, centuries, crossing centuries. So to try and recreate an environment that's comfortable is incredibly difficult to um, pin it down on an investigation. Yeah, I've, I've, I've had the chance to work with, with, with several groups. Um, I used to be case manager of the Canadian Paranormal Society, and I've uh, consulted with a team out of Der- uh, Derbyshire, and I've talked to teams in Australia, and there's a very big culture shift with, with teams in various parts of the world, and being able to work with, 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 with different teams also helped me broaden my perspective a lot. I I don't belong to a team right now, so I don't really work that closely with with as much teams as I should right now. Um, as of right now, I'm actually more of a paranormal researcher because I, I I haven't really been able to to dedicate as much time as as I want to to spending time on location. Whereas two two years ago, every single weekend I was off doing a different investigation. Mm-hmm. So when 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 I'm at events, nine times out of ten, I'm I'm being introduced to people who've never investigated before, and that's and and that's really what paranormal exposure is for. It's to is to show people that hey, if this is the field you want to get into, you have a lot of work to do. 
it's not just as easy as grabbing a K2 meter and going. Mm-hmm. It's it's not as simple as developing an opinion and and running with it. We are a scientific field. We are also a very religious field. And with with with, with over forty or blah, 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 with over four thousand different religions in the world, each religion helps people understand the paranormal from a much different perspective. And you also have have to understand. When, when you step into being a paranormal investigator, you're donning the hats of more than one person. You are doing investigation, but you're also doing public relations. You are kind of, a, kind of in a way, being a psychologist, even though you're nowhere near licensed to do so. If, if you're dealing with a family who has issues, you've got to understand laws. You've got, you've got to understand what you can and, can and can't do that, that, that could possibly violate their pri- privacy. Mm-hmm. So. That's where that's what I rent what I, what I wrote the the book about. It's it's not so much for an entry level invest, investigator. It's it's for everybody. But at the same time, I have a lot of entry level things in there that's not quite entry level. It's so just, basically, what your what your book is about is actually taking it from a ghost hunting where you just go out and basically have a bit of fun. Um, like you see on the TV shows, and you're actually introducing people into a paranormal investigation. So it's that next step. Yes, it's it's showing people that what we are doing is not just going out and thumping around in the dark. That there's a lot of historical research that goes into this. There's also a lot of understanding of psychology that goes into this. There's a large amount of public affairs that goes into to something like this. It's like with, with me being a law enforcement officer, it's, it's, uh, I'm a public figure. You know, if, if I do one thing wrong, I'm going to be in a spotlight and not in a good way, you know, and it's, it's very much the same thing with, with being a, being a paranormal investigator. When, when people come to you for help, it's your face they see. And they're going to expect you to know everything, even though being a paranormal investigator, you can't possibly know know everything. But the general public does not understand that. And you get people who watch the shows but want to know more about it. So that's why I titled the book Paranormal Exposed is because I am exposing what the paranormal actually is and not just the production value that you see on TV. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which, you know, a lot of um, more seasoned investigators understand but i think do you not think that's an evolution of yourself though through the paranormal journey it's a journey you undertook yourself it's a journey that i've gone through from watching um tv shows and reading magazines and then coming into the field you learn as you go along do you not feel that that is something that naturally happens if you continue down this road or whether or not it's something that doesn't happen as much as you think it should well, I know for me personally, I know how how I was at ten years old to how I was at twenty years old to how I am now being almost thirty years old, and I know how much I've changed with the more with as many cultures as I've experienced, and I know how much my views have changed. I I remember being twenty one years old, fresh out of the military. I was quite. I don't know if if, if I can cuss on the radio station. A little bit. Uh, I was an asshole at 21 years old. I I spat my opinion like like it was no one's business. I was insulting. I was quite the bigot. I was I was I, I was mean. But I learned that you can't do that with people. And the more the more I interacted with people, and the more I traveled, and the more and the more I saw, the more I was able to not only develop as a person but also as a paranormal investigator because then I, that's when I really start, started to realize, hey, I can't be mean to this person on the street corner just because he got in my way. So why do I think that I can go on to an, an investigation and beat my chest and, and try to provoke a, a response? It doesn't work like that. So it was a giant learning curve for me. And I and I saw myself grow, and I and I think you're right. I think writing Paranormal Exposed kind of talked about my evolution as well, without really going into basically who I was. 
I only talked about who I was in the about author section and a little bit of of the first chapter. The rest was everything that everything to do that I've learned. Mm-hmm. So yeah, but I, a lot a lot of things you're talking about there. That's just nat- natural evolution as each individual. We all change from the time we're ten to twenty to thirty. And hell, wait till you get fifty, you're going to think about what you thought at twenty and thirty was absolutely asinine. It just it's just that evolution of humanity that's who we are as people. We we evolve, we grow, we mature, we age. Well, most of us do, some of us don't. <laughs> 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 but but as far as of getting your opinion, things like that, that's that's something that you can do anytime and all the time. It's just a matter of your approach. Yeah. I mean if you was beating on your chest on things like that, then yeah, you're right. You're taking the wrong approach, but that's that's part of the problem to me right now in the paranormal field is everybody's afraid to speak their opinion honestly and openly because they're afraid of the people that either want to A, get offended by it, or B, take it as an insult to them and get defensive. And it's, it's not progressing. We're not progressing that way because most people don't want to talk openly about it, even if they disagree with the other person. They want to con- coddle each other and, and baby it or talk behind their backs. And that's what's going to stop all of us from progressing, not just in the field, but period, in life. Yeah. Uh, there, Damn. But- also, a couple of, of it's other. Maybe it's not like a grown up. <laughs> but I've also noticed in, in the field too. You got the people like 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 everyone on the show right now who actually put in the time, the effort, the energy into studying and developing and growing. And then you just get those people. I'm not going to drop a name as to who, but uh, they are quite. Are they turn into being a narcissist, and they value their image over helping people? They they're in it for their own fame and glory, than to, but, to actually better the field. But and, people do that when they get attention. We're we're all attention whores. Every one of us in this world like to have the attention, and the more accolades and attention you get, the more you want. That's just who we are. We're, we're narcissistic creatures. Period. This so is, that's going to happen just about any time you get somebody that gets as. You get a few hundred friends on Facebook, you're cool. But next thing you got a couple thousand, you think you're the the shit. And then you get to over five thousand, you gotta start a second page. Oh my god, everybody loves me. And now you think that you're setting a trendsetter. That's just how people are. That's it's sad, and it's but it's true. Excuse me while I take it while I take a selfie. <laughs> I do think I do think um, there's a lot to be said for both. I do think you do have people that have an ego and are, are out there for the fame and glory. I don't think that's as many as people are calling out on social media these days. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, you could say that because we do radio shows. We, we're only doing this for fame and glory. And no, you, we're doing this have... to, you know, because we really enjoy doing it. Exactly. You know. But... John used to do radio show also, so you're telling me that the two of you have never had people say that about you already. I hear it because I'm on two different networks and I was on four different shows a week. They're like, oh, don't you just think you're all that hot shit? No, I just enjoy what the hell I'm doing. Yeah. Who do you think you are? I'm Jay Lynch. Yeah, I mean, I do except that for, now and I get called out for it sometimes. Except for I'm I don't just, care. I'm, I, I enjoy what I do. I think I'm actually quite good at it. Um I, I'm learning all the time in regards I, to the paranormal. I certainly wouldn't put myself out as an expert in any way, shape, or form. But I love talking to people. That's why I do what I do. Um, and I think the majority of people in the field either fall into the the TV side by quite by accident sometimes. You do have those egotistical people, but not to the extreme that is being called out at this moment in time. And... Um, you know, we, we all do the paranormal. No one gets rich from the paranormal. Very, very, very few people get rich and, from the paranormal. And the more majority that are getting called out are getting called out by people who are absolutely, and, and I've seen it time and time again, I've seen about 80% of the ones that I see right now, are getting called out by people that used to work with them, that used to be friends with them, that used to be on their team, and they had some kind of little rift, and they split, and they say, well, now look what they're all doing. And, and it's, it's jealousy more than anything else. It's not the fact of what they're doing. It's not the fact that they actually got this five minutes of fame. It's the fact that they got it without them. Yep. It's, it's like I, uh, <laughs> I recently started to act in movies and TV shows, and, of course, I've had people get very upset with me because I'm working on a movie or I'm working on a TV show, and then they realize that I actually went to film school, and they go, oh, well, still, I don't care. So I, I think there's a, there's a big difference between actually enjoying – 
what you do and doing it for the sake of actually enjoying it than doing it because you're actually obsessed with becoming something. Or becoming oh, that's or, without a doubt. That's true there. But like I said, like, and I agree with what Kara said, the majority of the people are doing it because that's what they enjoy to do. I, Nate, you was on the other network for a long time. They, none of us making no money off this blogging. There's, there's hundreds of blogs out there, hundreds of channels, oh. if not thousands. We do it because we enjoy what we do. We enjoy interacting and talking with people. So there, you're going to find that few that are narcissistic as hell, yes. But the majority of the people do it because they love what they do. They love that interaction. And and I just don't see how this whole bashing thing is, is just getting out of control. It's, it's childish. And that's coming from one of the most childish assholes I can find on the planet. I even <laughs> think it's childish. What's that tell you? <laughs> I do, but it is human nature. It is very true what um, John is saying. It's a human nature thing. And if we have that in today's society, what makes us think that that didn't happen back in the day, even on a very smaller scale without the social um, interaction? Do you know what I mean? So even within a household, you'd get that between servants. You know, one person does something for, for the lord of the manor in the UK kind of thing, and the rest of the servants would be up in arms about it and saying that they were, excuse my French, the arse licker. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. So I do you, see he has a point. It's something you have to consider. You can't, yeah, but the, but like you said, you can't get more than three people together to not have somebody be jealous of somebody else. I don't care what organization it is. Paranormal, church, school, if you get, so-and-so shouldn't have worn that. So -so, they always do it. It's because yeah. people are trivial. We're, they're, the majority of them are petty. And, right. and they can't – and they're also – most of them don't really – it's not really about that person that they're pinpointing things out about. It's some inferior, inferiority complex of themselves that they're projecting on someone else. Instead of dealing with their own issues, they point the attention to somebody else. Yeah, people Deal with your own. Sense. Deal with your own shit before you come after mine because, trust me, you want to call my skeletons out, <laughs> I'll brag them all out. Let's drag everyone of them out here and throw them on the floor and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> you got your Halloween laugh down already, oh, Jay, God, is all I'm, I'm saying. So ready for it. <laughs> so one thing I want to ask you, Jonathan, is um how do you how do your colleagues in the in the law enforcement area, how do they take to what you do? Well, quite frankly, only a few people know. <laughs> ah. Um for a very good reason. Um Basically, uh, I'm trying to count as many people that actually know what I do. I think there's maybe four people in my entire department that actually know what I do. Um, I, uh, I only have two friends on Facebook that I actually work with at the department. One could, could give a crap less what I do. The other, she's actually very interested in what I do and actually would love to go with me on an investigation. Um, I've got... An instructor that was my one of my defensive tactics instructor. He's obsessed with it, and I he's asking me every time he sees me, "Hey, when can I go with you to an investigation?" And every time I try to get him to go on on investigation, he gets scared and doesn't want to go. Other than that, no one really knows. Um, I think I think the sheriff knows because I did I did submit a packet to go to an event that I couldn't go to, um, the Gettysburg Bash uh, in September. I did not get authorized to go to that one because well we we're understaffed, so I couldn't get could not get the time off. So I'm, I think he's aware, but he hasn't said anything to me about it. Uh, the other reason why I'm not vocal about it is um, right now I primarily work in the jail. So as the less about me that gets around to the inmates, the better. So I keep my personal life on the hush-hush as much as possible. So that way an inmate can't learn that about me and then send out a message and the next thing you know I'm I, I'm a target. So there's a lot of operational security that, that that goes on with what I do. I make no mystery about it. Working in law enforcement is very, 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 very dangerous. And you, and you have to watch your six at all times. So I don't really go into detail at work about it. Well, that uh, makes sense to me, in all honesty. Now, you don't live far from New Orleans, and I can't not talk about New Orleans because it's on my bucket list. Um have you investigated anywhere in New Orleans, John? 
I I'll actually there them up. Uh, I actually investigate here as often as possible. Um, I have access to to a couple of bars, uh, and I'm trying to get clearance to go into one. I think this weekend, but getting a location here in New Orleans is like pulling teeth because it is on everybody's list to want to go. Um, there is virtually no field here. As shocking as as that is, the paranormal field outside of the people who actually live here, like me, Kevin, Randy, uh, Sasha, a few others, we're really all there is here for paranormal. Uh, we had, there's a, a group here that does little investigations, and then there was uh, Louisiana Spirits who covered New, New, New Orleans, but that's really about it. So locations here, since New Orleans is actually a very big city for film industry. So film industry rules the land here. So to get anywhere, you need production equipment, production insurance, and quite frankly, places that people want to investigate is like the Lowry Mansion, St. Louis Cemetery, uh, places like that. Well, the Lowry Mansion will not let a single investigator in, period, no matter how much you pay they will say no. St. Louis Cemetery is closed to the public, from what I understand, uh, due to some recent vandalism and the archdiocese of New Orleans said, screw this, no more. Uh, so getting into a place here is pretty tough. But I do I do re- as many residentials as possible. Uh, you can get into smaller bars if, if, if you know the bar owner. But investigating the French Quarter is difficult because it's never it's never quiet in in the French Quarter especially especially on Bourbon Street so getting a good commercial location is pretty difficult I promise to be quieter when I'm there <laughs> well, I, think, I think you're the least of least of our worries on Bourbon Street you're not it's going to be so loud on Bourbon Street you're you're not even you're not even going to hear yourself think <clears throat> Apparently, he has been around a crazy redneck too many times. We are in, in Louisiana, Jay. I said redneck, not Cajun. There's a difference. Yeah, we're smarter than red redneck. <laughs> we're like rednecks, but we're 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 more sophisticated. <laughs> so, so with your experience um, in regards to law enforcement, how does that translate into your investigations? Do you have does it? Has it changed how you approach your investigations? Actually, a lot different. Um, I'm not as trusting as I used to be with the investigations, um, especially with what a client tells me. I'm a little bit more critical on what they are are telling me, and that's just a byproduct of dealing with the magnitude of people that I deal with. So to be able to convince me that something is is actually true, I kind of need – significant evidence in order to do so so and so and that could be a good and a bad thing at the same time um also i am much more critical on on evidence now which i view that as really really good because how i used to be it was like okay here's a a very soft class c evp i'll just go ahead and file it in there now mm, i can't hear it i can't i can't understand it could just be someone uh, exhaling, removing the microphone, and I throw it out. Um, so I'm I'm much more more critical on my evidence now. When it comes to people and people skills, I'm far better than I used to be because uh, yeah, I have to I have to maintain a certain amount of prof- professionalism while dealing with people. So that ability tra- translates over. So I can be more polite to people. I can be more receptive of their culture and more receptive of their their religious values. So that way I can be able to adhere to them and make them as calm and happy as possible while still being able to, to do my job. Well, that's interesting because, you know, um, we have a team in the UK called PIGS who are police officers and they approach um, paranormal investigations from a very different really? way. Yeah, they are. Actually, named their team pigs. Yeah, <laughs> yes, that's an insult to the law officer over here. Yeah, 
No, it's paranormal investigation. Something. Oh, they. I can't, They do have a, somebody in the law enforcement that name over here. They're probably going to take their baton out and knock the hell out of you. Well, that's, that's what they call insult. themselves. No, they don't see that. That's what they call themselves over here. They probably find that funny over here. Actually, if I had if I had a dollar for every time I've been been called a pig in six months, I can probably buy a new house. <laughs> but I'm just oh, saying that's a major that's insult. That's the English irony. That's just the English irony. I mean, it wouldn't bother me. Trust me. I usually every time somebody tries to find a word that insults me, I usually embrace it and enjoy it and have fun with it. Actually, come to think about it, I think pig is the is the nicest name that I have been called. Uh, actually, I, I get called a racist more times than, than anything just because I'm a white person and a pig human being. Well, so they break their investigations down and they look at it as a case file rather than as a paranormal investigation. So that that's how they work um, in the field. And, and they come up with some really interesting things because of how they work. They look at very much at location and environment and, like you said, the psychology of people. Mm-hmm. So I know some other people that over here that are in law enforcement do the same st- similar style. They take their the way they re- review and investigate a case, and they do it that way, and not so much as the way most paranormal investigators do, or as seen on TV. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jonathan, your book, how long has that been out, and where can we get that? Um, it, it just it just got submitted to the publisher. Um, I got the foreword written by a friend of mine. It's sitting with the publisher, and it's hitting the prints probably early next week. So uh, once they finish the edit per process, it should be online Monday or Tuesday, so you can order it directly offline uh, sometime next week. As far as actual prints go, I'm not going to have hard copies of the print probably until two or three weeks from now. So uh, if you want a signed copy, you're going to have to order it online and then just catch me at an event or you, or you can mail it to me and I'll sign it and mail it back to you. Or I'll probably end up buying like two or three cases of the book once the physical co- copies are ready. So that way people can just order it from me directly and I can just sign off on them and send them. Okay. Do you have a website or is that from Dark Moon Press? It's uh, uh, currently – I have a website that's currently being built. It's not up yet. But you can go to darkmoonpress.com and you can type in my name or go to browse authors and I should be like maybe like a fifth or sixth person down. You can just click on my name. It'll take you to the Paranormal Exposed book. You can order how many copies you want. You pay for it and as soon as as as, as it's printed, it'll be sh- it'll be shipped off to you. Cool. And it covers location. So. Before we go, because we haven't got long now, um, what was your favorite location that you've ever investigated? Ooh, my favorite location would actually have to be St. Albans Sanatorium in Radford, Virginia. While uh, I was there with, with a friend of mine, uh, they were filming for their, for their show, True Ghost Stories, and, and I got to be a guest investigator for that, 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 that episode. And we actually caught some significantly in, in, like in, like evidence I have never experienced before, and it was a very emotional sort of investigation because of what had happened at St Albans, that specific part of the investigation that we were focusing on. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about what, about what it is because I think uh, they have yet to release the episode, but uh, I. I, I, I can say this that there was that it, it was a murder that that took place and we got evidence that that supported that and it was a it was a very emotional experience and uh, we 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 really used the 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 EDI a lot I don't I don't know if you know what that is uh, it's a brick that gives you like EMF and temperature and reads vibrations all right okay and we were reading the case file off and the more we got into it the more that device was just going off it was incredible and uh i can't i can't wait to go back and uh if if if, if anybody wants to go investigate st albans san- sanatorium you can contact uh marcel 
Hanauer or go to St. Albans Sanatorium dot com and you can actually book the the venue for you and your team. I think it's only like like six hundred dollars. Right, Jay? I have no idea. I've not been there yet. I think I think we need to make think we all need to make a point to go. Carrie, get your ass over here so we can take you. I know. I oh so I need to come to America. Well, I need to win the lottery, is what I need to do. That would be, nice. <laughs> be lovely. I could ship everybody everywhere. <laughs> oh, I need to manifest some money so I can get to America. That is for sure. Because there are so many locations in America that I'd love to investigate. Yep. Uh, from, from coast to coast, I can't even put a number on how many great locations there are. The other uh, lo- location that I, had, that I had a lot of fun with was uh, in West Palm Beach, Florida at the Gulfstream Hotel. Uh, a group there called War Party Paranormal uh, r- runs it, and I got a whole lot of awesome evidence out of that too. And one, one event that I was doing with Rob Nimmerist, uh there was a spirit there who just – didn't like me, but uh, I think that that wraps up our time. I think it does. Anyway, thank you for listening. Jay? Y'all have a good night. Bye. See you later. It's not Thank you for listening. Don't forget to join us for more shows throughout the week. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, and the World Wide Web to keep up to date with all the shows right here on Parasearch Radio.